I want you to consider this as we continue this study tonight. Your relationship with God is going to determine how you act. If you're not right with God like you should be, you're not going to be right in what you do. If your fellowship is not right, you're going to have different ideas. You're going to take a different path. You're going to go a different way. Um, the casualness of the day, has, has, I believe, has happened because we've decided that we want to be a Christian on our terms. God's standard never changed. And uh, those that have been a part of the, the Bible Institute have heard me say this, and these are my two least favorite words, compromise and speculation. I want you to know that God never compromised, never has, never will. So if he has said, and he has, this is what I expect, this is what I want, this is what I desire, he hasn't changed. But we have. We've changed. We've gone our own ways. Why? Because of casualness. Uh, and speculation has overtaken truth. That, uh, well, I, I just believe this is what this means. I believe this is what this says. And that's become the standard that many people live by now. Uh, I've often thought about this. that I, I believe you can only be saved one way, by the way. But I also believe after that that you need to be taught right. Yes, right. When the Bible says, you know, uh, in, in the Great Commission about, you know, teaching them to observe, well, there, means, there needs to be a teaching after right. a person is saved. And I believe that there are people in this world that have been saved that have not been taught right, right. after that. Right. But they are going to live according to what they've been taught. Right. And the... It's almost as if the norm of our day is casual Christianity. And it shouldn't be that way. In Matthew I mean Mark chapter 13, the Bible says, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not uh, when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. That's us. And to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. To all. It's our responsibility. Uh, we've been commanded by God to watch. Now, we've looked at several uh, things about watching. And uh, um, just to be honest, I I'm going to just, uh, I'm not going to be like most politicians. I really will try to be transparent about what I'm about to say. When I'm given this opportunity, I don't take it lightly. Nobody should ever do that. But at the same time, I do not want to take advantage of that overly taken advantage of that. So, uh, I've got a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of information. I've got a lot of material. But it's not my place to just continue on like that. So, I want to give some examples of something tonight that I think is very important. And then maybe I'll try to summarize all this next week by talking about the results of casualness, which we are seeing in the world and, and, and kind of why it's gotten that way. Uh, I, I do like this. I've heard all my Christian life that uh, uh, there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be an apostasy. Right. Then I heard somebody say early, also early in my Christian life, but that doesn't have to be you. Right. We don't have to fall away. Right. We can still stand for what's right. Uh, we, we don't have to be casual. Right. We don't have to be and you understand this word, contemporary. Right. We don't have to be worldly. Right. We can be godly. Yes. And if we do that, 
What does the Bible say? You suffer persecution. Okay? So, if we'll follow God, I'm promising you we win. There's just no other way around it. So, if you take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 21. I want us to look at something tonight about watching with proper behavior and then watching in light of imminent danger. All right, two things tonight. Watching with proper behavior. In Luke chapter 21, uh, verse 34, the Bible says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, uh, I'll have to admit to you, surf surfeiting or surfeiting is a word I'm not familiar with. That's not my, in my vocabulary. So not only did I look it up, I even tried to look it up to see how you're supposed to pronounce it. All right? And I was trying to say surfeiting, and it's surfeiting, according to the people that supposedly know how to pronounce that word. But it's a very interesting word. When we, and, and according to Scripture, in verse 34, not only uh, do we need to be careful about surfeiting, but concerned about being overcharged with it. I will tell you this. Have you, I know you've heard this saying many, many times. You just give an inch, they'll take a mile. All right? Giving an inch in surfeiting will take you down a path of a mile. And when you go in that direction, you will be overcharged. It will literally take over before it's over with. All right? The Bible says, take heed to yourselves. It's necessary to maintain a focus upon the task of watching. A casual approach will leave you vulnerable to attack. Yeah. If you don't have your eyes open, if you're, not, if you're not alert, if you're not aware, the Bible has already referred to it as being asleep. If that's the way we are spiritually with the things that are, are around us, I'm telling you, the enemy will sneak in and he will come in unawares because we're not looking for them. The Bible says uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That's the idea of all of a sudden becoming casual. Yeah. That, uh, not realizing how important what we're doing really is. Right. And how, uh, whether you realize it or not, I promise you, if you claim to be a Christian, make any kind of claim like that whatsoever, you're under observation. I'm not talking about from Big Brother. I'm talking about from everybody that you come in contact with. You're being watched. You're being observed. And until they get in the Bible, you might be the only Bible they see. They're watching you. How are you going to respond to this? How are you going to react in this situation? Or actually responding is the right word. Most of the time we react. Yeah. Yep. I've heard it said that we react in the flesh and respond in the spirit. Wow. I mean, it's, it's real quick, easy to react, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. Just go out on the interstate. Yeah. Right. See how it goes. Wow. You know? My illustration of Riverside Drive means absolutely nothing to you. That was from my hometown. If you go on Riverside Drive you had to be saved and sanctified and all that kind of thing to keep from losing your religion. Well, it's kind of that way in a lot of places, isn't it? But the, but the thought here is that you need to take heed to yourselves. You know the story in the Bible about the, the moat and the beam where you're trying to find fault and have, maybe have found fault with somebody else and don't realize you have fault yourself? The Bible says here, take heed to yourselves. You might be able to look around and say, well, I believe they're casual, and I believe they're casual. 
All right, well, look in the mirror. Take heed to yourselves. Where are you in this situation? Paul said, I, 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 need to, I need to keep myself in check. I need to be subject to the Lord because it, it, it can happen where I could preach to others and I would become a castaway. Uh, you need to travel light. Uh, the Bible talks about the, the uh, encumbrances that we have. Laying aside every weight. Everything that is weighting us down, that's, that's dragging us away, or uh, is causing us not to be able to move forward as we should. We need to travel light in this world if we're to stay on top of our responsibilities as watchmen. Uh, by the way, the longer you, you hold on to it, the, the deeper it gets entrenched. Uh, have you ever seen a car get cleaner by being dirty? What does it do? It gets dirtier as time goes on. Well, we're the same way. The longer you let it stay there, the dirtier you get. So it's got to be dealt with. Uh, the idea of being overcharged with surfeiting is to be burdened down with self-indulgence. That word surfeiting is another word for gluttony. All right, now, I know that when homecomings come around, no preacher ever preaches on gluttony. I know that. I mean, we, we enjoy homecoming. But you know that's not what this is talking about. The idea of it's for me, it's for me, it's for me. And when that starts to happen, we become very, very vulnerable. When we are all about us, then we're not about God. When it's about what I can get and what I want, when we are overcharged with that, it takes the focus off of the task and weighs us down with all of these things that we're easier prey. With the devil. When anything takes the rightful place of God and His will, we have become self centered. We have become self indulgent. And I know we would never admit to this, but we become idolatrous. Anytime that anything is between us and God, that's an idol. No matter what it is. And one of the things that becomes our idol the easiest is ourself. Yes, true. True. It's about me. Is this what I want? Yeah. I mean, I think this is the way we ought to do it. Yeah. See, that's what's happened in the church. Yeah. This is the way I think it ought to be, and we've just bypassed what God said was the way it was right. supposed to be. Right. And when you do that, you get what you get. You get what you've done, what your, your idea is, your opinion. Your opinion of Christianity becomes the norm and in doing that, we bypass God. And you can't, you can't be right with God and bypass God. When we become overcharged with this self-indulgence, we become engorged with selfishness. Huh. And when life is about us, We've given over to idolatry. Overcharged means to be burdened down, to be overcome with the weight of something. So much that it, it gets to the point where you can't carry it. Yeah. And when you can't carry it, you can't do it. You can't be what God wants you to be. Then it uses the word drunkenness in this passage. It's, it's not only wrong from the biblical moral sense, but also from the fact that it will dull the person into ineffectiveness. I've told the pastor this, and maybe one of these days the Lord will let me finish it, or, or maybe I'll get out of the way and finish it. I've been trying to write a book for 20 years, and I've written 100 pages or so, I guess, of it. Lord gave me an idea a long time ago about driving under the influence. But it has nothing to do with alcohol. 
It has to do with how people drive under the influence of bitterness and anger and lust and greed. And what, they, what happens to them or to anybody that's driving under that kind of influence is what the influence is dictates the way they live, the way they think, the way they act. If you're anger, if you're angry, you're going to act angry. And you're going to respond to people that way. Right. You're driving under the influence. We're supposed to be driving under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Right. But you can drive under the influence of the flesh. Yeah. And when you do that, you're not honoring God. And you have no testimony to this world. Right. Here, the idea is that the drunkenness makes you so dull that... Things take control of you and take you in the direction that it dictates. And what casualness has done, it's taken the church and taken it that way. Right. Right. God help. And people are perfectly content with that. Why? Because they're casual. Yeah. They like it that way. Yeah. See, I'm looking for a church that suits me. Wow. That's casualness. Yeah. I'm looking for the church of my choice. That's casualness. If you're looking for the church that God chose for you, that's not casual. That's faith. That's trusting. That's, that's what we need to have. All right, now let me give you an illustration of something, and we're, we're going to look at the, the next thing here. Uh, there are two illustrative lions in the Bible. All right. One is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. That's Jesus Christ. And He is to be received and relied upon. But there's a second lion in the Bible, the devouring lion. And that's the devil. He is to be rejected and resisted. Now, one is our friend. The other one just claims to be. Because he's a deceiver. He's a counterfeit. He's actually our foe. And the devil is not some Hollywood concoction. The devil is real. And he is a present and imminent danger. When I lay my head down to go to sleep at night, I really don't think, I, I just don't think about somebody breaking in the house. I just don't think about it. And I'm one of those, I'm blessed this way and I know that. I mean, it usually takes me, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds to go to sleep. I mean, I toss and turn at least that long. Yep. You know? <laughs> but if there's a noise in the house that wakes me up, a noise I don't recognize. A noise that sounds like maybe somebody's in the house that's not supposed to be there. Like Samuel Filbert. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No. If there's somebody in the house, everything about my attitude changes. Because I believe there's an imminent danger there. Something that I just can't be casual about well that's, that's, that's the world we live in there is a clear present imminent danger of the devil the Bible says verse you're very familiar with 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour uh, we've, already, we've already mentioned this. The English word vigilant in this verse is exactly the same word as watch. And watchful is translated that way in other parts of the Bible. The admonition here is to be extremely alert because the enemy is on the prowl with nothing but destructive intentions. The devil wants you. Jesus told Peter he wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to just come after you and ruin you. 
no matter what he says to you. He's an imminent danger to us. Think of what your approach would be if you found yourself in the midst of an area filled with wild, hungry lions. Would you sleep? Uh, would you not pay attention? Would you just nonchalantly walk around as if there was no danger? Would you take a casual approach? Well, of course not. But we do. Because that's exactly where we are. We're in a den of lions in this world. The devil's after you. You say, oh, oh, I'm no big deal. You know, he's not, really, he's not really after me. He's got plenty of company, plenty of help. Yeah. He's after you. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I promise you that, I don't know if you noticed it this, tonight when you walked in, did you notice that big target on the building out here? You didn't notice it? Oh, it's out there. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Because this is going to be one of his main targets. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A church that wants to stand for the truth. Yeah. A church that wants to do what's right. Yeah. A church that's trying to follow God. Yeah that's going to have a bigger target on it. Yep. Why would he put a target on a casual church? He's already got them. Right. We are living in a time of clear, present, imminent danger. The danger's real, and the devil's intention is to devour us. All right, now, having said that, take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. <clears throat> and in verse 11. Then these men assembled, the Bible says, and found Daniel praying, making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall have a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? All right, let me, let me just clarify something very quickly. A lion's den can be a home where lions live, but the lions might not be at home. That's not what this is. This is a den of lions. Right. They're home. Right, right. And they're hungry. Yes. And they're just waiting. Yep. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. And answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, that Daniel, wow, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. You notice he wasn't displeased with Daniel. He was displeased with himself. Why? He'd been tricked by his own people. Sound familiar? Hmm. Interesting. Amazing how relevant the Bible is. He was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Well, it didn't work. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statutes which the king establish, establisheth may be changed. And the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Amen. I mean, what? that's a lot of faith for a heathen king, don't you think? And a stone was brought, laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, 
that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. You know what the king was not about this? Casual. He was really concerned about this. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king. By the way, Daniel was not going to say anything if he had already been eaten by the lions. Maybe if he was dead yet speaketh like Abel, I don't know. But not here. He spoke. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth. Now, please notice that. Who shut the lion's mouth? Not Daniel. You got to understand that. Not Daniel. And hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. There was imminent danger there, but they've not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Now, Daniel was put into the den of lions. Why? Because he prayed. Because he made the king's other rulers look bad. Because they didn't like the way Daniel lived. He wasn't pious. He wasn't arrogant. He wasn't casual. He was sold out to God. And they saw that. And they saw something different in him that they did not have. And rather than join Daniel... They wanted to get rid of Daniel so they could just be what they were. And they knew that they could get him with prayer because they knew he was a devout man and he prayed. All right. uh, they, could, uh, they would not be hindered by restraints to where they could not reach Daniel. The, the, the lions were there. They, listen, they were not in chains where they couldn't get him so far. They, it was a den of lions where the lions had free reign. Now, I've heard this. You know, Daniel laid his head on the mane of the lion and all that kind of stuff, and I, that's got to be in the NIVs, all I know. <laughs> it was not passive. But God shut their mouth. So I'm asking the question in this, if the command is to be sober and to be vigilant in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, certainly that's a principle that God gives us to put into practice. Don't you think Daniel stayed awake? Don't you think he watched? Don't you think he was alert? And if he was accustomed to praying three times a day, you think he stopped in the den of lions? Of course not. Now, this is what I, I'd, I'd like for us to be able to see this, that we have to understand that there has to, we have to strike a balance in the way we're supposed to live as Christians. Now, I'm not talking about balancing our Christianity with the world. I'm not talking about that at all. But the idea of faith and good works are both found in the Bible. God tells us to do things. Okay? Right. And in those doing things, we have to have faith right. in God. Total reliance upon God. Right. Uh, the Bible that I had before this one, it was a King James too, by the way. Don't, don't get the wrong idea. Uh, but it just completely fell apart. And so, I, you know, I, I, I had this one and I started using this one. But... In the Old Testament, 
over a particular passage of Scripture, and you can understand what this passage of Scripture was, I wrote this. God versus Goliath. I know David gets a lot of credit. And David did do what God wanted him to do. David slung the stone. God guided the stone. David fought Goliath by faith. God honored the faith and defeated Goliath. So there's a balance there. Faith is not this. All right, God. Get at it. Too, too, way too many commandments in the Bible for that. But total reliance upon God is exactly the way we're supposed to live. You see, there's a balance there. Casualness, a lot of times, we'll trust ourselves. Sometimes casualness will just back up and say, well, God's going to do it anyway. I don't need me to be getting involved. But see, here's the thing. None of that's scriptural. God is not going to violate his word. He's going to do it the way it's supposed to be done. He always does. We are supposed to have a, 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 a testimony. We are supposed to have a, a diligence, a vigilance, a soberness. We're supposed to be, remember that word, faithing. We're supposed to be acting upon that which God has told us to do. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, who through faith, Subdued kingdoms. Now, if you read this, if you're not careful, you'll say, well, look at what they did. All right? Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Now, did Daniel do that? He did not. But he did everything God wanted him to do. The next thing, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 11, if, if you think, oh, yeah, we did that, the next one says, quench the violence of fire. You think those three boys in that fire stopped that fire? Nope. Right. I mean, I don't know what you think about it. I think they were as surprised as anybody else. But they trusted God. They said, we're not going to bow. Nope. And so you just do what you want to, but we're not going to bow. Right. So they exercised faith. They did what they could do, but they couldn't stop that fire. God did. God honored that faith. Quench the, quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. I mean, what matches Daniel for a den of lions? He's weak in that situation physically, but not in God. Wax valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Daniel didn't stop the lions, but he was faithful in his walk with God. He was obedient to the commandments of God. He trusted God in whatever situation he found himself. He walked by faith, and therefore God shut the mouths of the lions. Wow. Nothing casual about Daniel at all. No, sir. Truth is, if he had been casual, he wouldn't have been in that predicament. Actually, his zeal for the Lord causes persecution. Amen. He walked by faith, and therefore God shut the lion's mouth. Faith is a total reliance upon God. It's not a fold your arms and set down faith. It's a watchful faith. We are to be sober and vigilant because God has commanded us to do so. There has to be a balance. If not, we're going, to get ca we're going to become casual. We gain the victories because God wins the battles on our behalf. Yeah, that's good. But he also told us to fight. That's right. All right, now, I'm going to say something here 
Let me read this first, and I'm going to say a couple of things that I think are important, and we're going to close it up. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 21 says this, And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. If you're saved, the only thing that the world, the flesh, and the devil can threaten you with is heaven. I was reminded when I first got saved, I was told by some of my friends of the day that you've just thrown your life away. You know. You're supposed to be famous. You're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be doing that and all this kind of stuff. You, and you've you thrown all that work away, thrown all that talent away. The only thing that I found out that I really gave up was hell. And I'm glad I gave that up. When you know this along the way that God shows you something that just lights you up. Yeah. There, there are verses in the Bible that are, are hard to understand because maybe the way they're worded or it's just so far beyond who we are and, and our finite minds and all like that, but God can reveal it to you. Yeah. The Bible says we're more than conquerors. Right. I mean, how can you do more than win? And I'm looking at that, and I've said, all right, now, again, y'all remember my, my peanut illustration. God, you made the peanut. Show me how it works. God, this is your word. Show me what that means. How can you, how can you do more than win? If you're more than a conqueror, it means it's impossible for you to lose. Yeah. No matter what comes your way, right. you cannot lose. Well, that messes up some people's theology, but not the Bible. You cannot lose. God said, Joshua, I've got this. This is what I want you to do. You have a part in this. When Lazarus was in the grave, he told some people to move the stone. Jesus could have spoken, the stone could have rolled away. But he gave them something to do. I want you to do this. And then you watch what I'm going to do. So you do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You walk by faith. You trust him. You step out. When he says go this way, you go that way. If he says do this, you do that. And when you're doing that, but you have to realize when it's all said and done, if anything is going to be done of eternal value, God's going to have to do it through you. You can't do it on your own. Amen. And when we get this casual mindset, we think we've got it. Not so. All through the book of Daniel, Daniel's faith and obedience was honored by God in the presence of Ashpenaz. Uh, Daniel's faith was honored by God in revealing the king's dreams. We know that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah came out of the fire. God honored that. Uh, in chapter 4, God honors Daniel's faith by revealing the interpretation of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he could read the handwriting on the wall. God was, he put his faith in God and God worked through it. Right. So what did they do? They watched, they prayed, they were obedient, and they were faithful. Therefore, God worked through their faith on their behalf. Right. Get this. Uh, and if nobody hears this but me, it'll be okay. But I prefer you hear it too. We do not watch and pray so we can perform some cunning, masterful victory over the adversary, but so that we can exercise faith in God. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't do it. God does it through you. Right. We never have been a match for the devil. 
devil's no match for our God. It's God that brings the victory. All right, now, I'm telling you, we live behind enemy lines. We're living in constant, imminent danger from the devil. So while we're in the den of lions, we need to pray. We need to watch. We need to be obedient to God. We need to do what He would have us to do. Do I believe that, if, I mean, if God could have done anything He wanted to in that den of lions? But He would be that one that had to do it because Daniel couldn't do it. Daniel had already done his part by being faithful, by being obedient. They're trying to get us to quit. But you can't. You can't. To be watchful is to exercise faith that is manifested through the power of God. That's where we need to be. All right. Next week, I want to look at the consequences of casualness. Uh, boy, there sure has been a lot of collateral damage. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the Bible says that there, there can be a time when our good works are evil spoken of. Right. I'm afraid what's really happening now is our evil works are being well spoken of. Right. church is supposed to be different. Can't be casual. Lord, thank you tonight for meeting with us. Thank you, Lord, that I believe you came in to squeeze our heart, to remind us of some things. To maybe take a, as your word said, to take heed unto ourselves. That we might see where we are. And might see where we need to be. Lord, we need to combat this casualness. It needs to be fought against. But I'm afraid it's taking over. And it's just, it's just going to lead to this widespread apostasy. But thank you, Lord, it doesn't have to be us. May we stand sure and steady, walking in faith, walking in obedience, walking in the light of your word. And we'll thank you, Lord. You and you alone are worthy of our praise. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor, would you please? Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.